Good morning to all of you. At the commencement of this excellent endeavor of actually organizing an international conference, and the title of this conference is Bridging the Gap through English, and it's also the theme is E for Ease. E as in English for number four for education, equity, employability, and empowerment. Empowerment, but I'm going to add one more E today to it for elevation as well. We we come to that in a few minutes as we proceed with the course of what I have to share with you. I'm delighted to be here and absolutely happy that the entire team, we all have tried to work in a very seamless and a collaborative, coordinated manner. I'd like to express my deep sense of gratitude to the president of today's function, Dr. R.P. Patel, who is incidentally an octogenarian. I took his permission to mention he's 82 years young. And <laughs> We also wish and pray that we continue to have the blessings of such people of eminence. They continue to live with us for many, many more years and share all the knowledge, the wisdom, the experience that they have shared. Because I think when you are really thinking of forging ahead and charting out a beautiful future, we have to be rooted in our past. We cannot forget the past. We have to be rooted in our ancient culture and straddle and move towards the frontiers, the cutting edge of the future. So I think we are especially grateful to him. I'm absolutely delighted that we are present here with Professor Par, Harish Tahit Par, who is the Honorable Vice Chancellor of the Sardar Patel University. In his own right, he's been an excellent academic leader, a researcher par excellence, who has carved out a very special name for himself in the field of research. And I must also place on record that whenever we at KCG, the Knowledge Consortium of Gujarat, the Commissionerate of Higher Education, and all these various bodies which we together, we all call ourselves members of the team higher education, whenever there's any initiative to be started, to be conceptualized, to be implemented. I've always found Professor Parr taking a lead in it and supporting it and actually going the full nine yards, making it happen. So a special acknowledgement that we should all give to him. <laughs> Needless to say, this conference wouldn't have been possible, but for the untiring efforts of Jadija Saab and our entire team at SCOPE, we now don't think of us as being different entities. We're all seamlessly integrated into one. And we'll come straight away to some of the ideas. What is this conference all about? What do we strive? What do we plan to do? I'll try to share some of my insights, perspectives, perceptions. And we do hope this conference is not going to be a one-off event. Neither is, just, is it just a Me Too event that there are many things happening and this is also uh, Me Too. I Too did it or Me Three. It's not that. It's something very special. And I think we have a telescopic vision of where this conference is going to take us. The idea right at the beginning is to not stop with this event. And hence, it's an invitation to many of you seated there, many of you who may be here, may not be here, to actually look at these as a series of milestones, punctuation marks, and it's an invitation. What if, or why don't we, have a series of such events beginning the starting the sort of kick off, as they say, or we're starting it off with this beautiful conference here, but then can we not have some symposia, colloquia, workshops, etc., at different locations within Gujarat hosted in different institutions so that a lot of work that all of us collectively have done today the world over whether it is Cambridge whether it's different countries across the world or whether it's different states of India just yesterday I was in Delhi for a special meeting that has been a committee which has been constituted by MHRD a special K subcommittee 
there two states such as Kerala, which are leaders in education in many, uh, if you look at various parameters, indicators, even states like that are looking up to us in Gujarat, especially for the innovative efforts we have made in English. And therefore, can we have such fora regularly organized where we have the right conducive atmosphere, the forum, the platform to be able to share what we have learned, to deliberate, to discuss, and also start collectively as a community chalking out the road ahead. Because it ought not to be something which is thought by someone and imposed on us, but this is something that collectively we all ought to do. And I think that is the spirit in which we would request each one of you, that's the lens and spirit through which we'd request each one of you to be involved in this conference so that the conference actually chalks out or charts out a trajectory, a path for itself and this should be followed by more such events. I'm not quite specifying the periodicity but it could even be at every quarter. So there are many institutions here, I see many academic leaders here, principals and people who have contributed a great deal. We are also happy that Harshad Bhai, the Vice Chancellor of Children's University is also here. So if all of us collectively could take up responsibility of hosting one such event, then this can become a community owned, community driven movement campaign across Gujarat. So that is probably the first point for your consideration that I would like to make. As is very clear, why do we look at these four words and the fifth one that has been mentioned as the theme of conference, bridging the gap through English? It presupposes that there is a gap. This is indeed a fact. There is a gap. There are various studies. There's a lot of research which has been done. And we find that today when we look at statistics, when we look at the gross enrollment ratio, when we look at statistics to show us the level of achievement or quality, we find that English would play a very major role in bridging this gap. The reason being, one of the tools or methods of being able to bridge this gap in a country like ours and in most developing countries would have to be ICT, Information and Communication Technology. So if you really talk of moving towards a paradigm of having more and more technology enhanced learning as a defining paradigm of transacting or partaking of education, access to technology and access to English becomes almost like a necessary condition. Because if for all the reserves, for all the treasure that's locked up in the internet, to be able to take it, to be able to absorb it, digest it, assimilate it, I think we must fortify, we must equip, we must ensure that each of our young men and women, young boys and girls, young children studying in schools, whether it's elementary education or even pre-primary education, must have some orientation to the English language. And therefore it is a must for ensuring that education, the edifice of education has a sound foundation. And at this point, I think it is absolutely imperative that we reflect for a minute, we go back to what the visionary person who has actually carved this whole scheme, SCOPE is an acronym, I think you all are aware of it, to ensure that in the morning there are some of you who may have been tired and might be feeling a little sleepy to shake you up as it were. Can I request anyone to expand the full acronym of SCOPE? Anybody from the audience? Yes, please. And that is Society for Creation of Opportunity through Proficiency in English. Thank you so much. And what is your name? Uh, I am Akash Chakka. Thank you, Akash. This has been, it's, it has been in, envisioned and conceptualized by our Honorable Chief Minister, Sri Narendra Bhai Modi. This happened way back in 2007. And I think the idea was encapsulated in a very nice statement that he has been making uh, in respect of English. I, I wouldn't dare translate it yet into English, but I would like anybody here in this audience to say what is that statement. It very pithily, in a very concise and crisp manner, talks of English, yes? Absolutely. 
I think we must uh, give him a big hand. <laughs> And of course, acknowledge the fact that this is what our Honorable CM has in mind. The idea is not to in any way relegate or push aside our mother tongue, our own culture. That's not the idea. But Angrezi no, abhav pannai ane, prabhav pannai. I think that is the spirit. So scope, if you see, is about language. It's not so much about literature. The idea is to ensure that our kids don't get left behind. Well, if there is a global world where we have to be equal partners, if we have to contribute towards creating knowledge societies, then language, just as there are many other factors, should not be a bottleneck, should not be a speed breaker, should not be an obstruction. And therefore, when we look at the first E, education, I think English is an absolute necessity. When we look at the second E, equity, this is very interesting in the course of my research as well and many interactions that we've had traveling across the length and breadth of this state and also different parts of India, whether it is Bihar, whether it is interior parts of Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu or whether it is parts of areas bordering the deserts of Rajasthan and Pakistan as well, located in our country, you find that this aspiration in people belonging to all communities, people belonging to all economic strata for having their children get English education is also something that we must respect. If you see the kind of mad rush that you have for English medium schools even today, this is again the idea is not to throw our own language, mother tongue etc. But I think there is an aspiration and since this is a democracy, we have to respect the healthy aspirations that people have. So if there are parents who feel that their children ought to have access to English education, not just parents, when we've actually tried to get the pulse of a lot of young people studying in tribal areas, studying in so-called backward areas and ask them about the need for English, it has unequivocally, they have very clearly, very overwhelmingly articulated the need for English too, because they don't want to be left behind and this is something that we must respect. The third aspect is related to these two, empowerment. And empowerment is not about the superficial, the patina, the veneer of English that we're talking about. I've often referred to two words beginning with a G. One word is gloss and the other word is glow. Can I request anybody in the audience, someone who has not spoken till now, to point out the difference between these two words, gloss and glow? Yes, please. Sushma ji. Gloss is the superficial, glow inside. Absolutely. You two wanted to, can I request you, because the more the merrier. Uh, well, uh, gloss na highlighted na certain words na highlighted for learning na purposes and glow shining na after being highlighted. I, I think both of you more or less are art articulating the same thing which is wonderful. Gloss is about something which is superficial, right? It's like a patina. If you take a varnish, I think we also have heard of lip gloss or we've heard of various things to gloss over something. The idea is you're just quickly scratching the surface of something and glow is like this lamp which is bright out there shining into our eyes, hurting our eyes maybe. It's like the glow of a lamp where the light comes from within. So the idea of empowerment is not just to have our kids mimic or imitate some of the practices that westerners sort of show on television shows etc. The idea is not just to look at the gloss well it's also good to learn, understand each other's cultures, respect them and have a healthy sort of outlook towards the beliefs of your neighbours and yourself. But I think it's equally important to empower people with this word called glow, to really grow strong from within to fortify our people. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Before that, I would again refer to the need for English for employability. I'm also happy to share with you that we have another, I'll say a trailblazer initiative happening in our state called Udisha. How many of you are aware of this initiative in this audience? Can I request you to raise your hands if you are aware? Okay. Now, the, answer, well, the 
percentage when many of you may not be able to see each other, I, I think it's not a hundred percent awareness level that we see here, but I think in the course of today and tomorrow, we will be explaining to you about Odisha as well. This is an effort which is aiming at making our youth more and more employable as well. Higher education is not merely about employability, it's about widening your knowledge, making you better human beings, developing problem solving abilities, critical thinking, creative thinking, being able to really contribute, do something path breaking for society, adding to the body of knowledge. But at the end of it, if you were to take somebody through a long winded staircase of 12 years of schooling and 3 years of college at the least, and at the end of it, if you were to just push him down a big deep cliff and say, hey, we've educated you, but then you're not fit to be employed. You cannot stand with dignity on your feet and sustain yourself, your family. You're not fit for that. I think there's something fundamentally wrong with the way we are imparting education. So the idea of setting up Odisha was to ensure that every student who passes out of our colleges has a choice of at least two job offers available in his or her pocket. Whether they choose to take a job or whether they choose to do further studies is certainly left. It's a question of volition. The student may choose to study further. Somebody might want to work. Somebody might want to work for a little while, again study. I mean, all these possibilities, freedom ought to be given. And that is how Udisha was envisioned and started. We actually conducted a study, when I say we, it was the gift city, I'm sure you've all heard of the Gujarat International Finance Tech City, which is coming up in a, in a, on a very big scale near Gandhinagar. It is believed that this might, the amount of transactions that this city would have, uh, it would virtually become the financial hub, not just of India, but of many countries across the globe. They commissioned a study to a very leading consultant, and they actually did a study in Gujarat to find out the levels of employability. And we were shocked to see that the levels of employability, this is not very different from the national data or national trends, but I don't think we need to be complacent, feeling that, well, we are as bad as the rest, or we are slightly better, but the employability as it exists today, or maybe two years before, when this three years ago, when the study was done, was as low as 13%. In worth, it hai ke je so vidya thiyo barma dhoran thi pas thai che ma thi matra ter jana ne rozgari ma te ni yogya ta che. The rest of them have gone through education, but there are only 13 who are fit for employment. The rest of them are not yet even fit for employment. But the study also talked of the remedial measures that can be taken and one of the important interventions which they flagged was that of fortifying and empowering our students with English skills. Because they said that they must have communication skills, they must have English skills. And therefore, the fourth E, when we say English for employability, we are absolutely hopeful and we, are, we have full faith that if students go through this rigor of actually equipping themselves with a proper uh, certification of English and go through the motions with sincerity, I'm sure it will certainly enhance their employability. Now having said that, I'll quickly come to the last part which is about elevation, which is also related to empowerment because empowerment is not just about the glossy empowerment. It's not about wearing a tie and a three-piece coat alone, but it's also about the, the self within, if we can really fortify them. Since we're all sitting here, we've also set up, Gujarat has set up something called the Gujarat Educational Innovations Commission. And we're very thankful to our Honorable Minister, Sri Raman Bhai Voda, who is not present here today, but he has been a pillar of strength, who has made sure that this act which was again envisioned by our Honorable Chief Minister, actually went through in the Vidhan Sabha. It has been tabled, it was passed as an act, and it is today probably the only state in the entire country which has such an outfit. And we're looking at various innovative practices that happen in the field of education, be it elementary, primary education, be it secondary, higher secondary education, or be it higher education. 
In fact, we also have some awards under this commission. We request all of you to visit our websites. Many of you who are carrying out innovative practices can apply for this. There are very handsome awards, fellowships also as a part of it. And this commission talks of five great educational innovators that our country has produced. And can I request some of you in this audience to talk of them? I'm, no, I'm sure many of you have heard of these. You can probably just name them quickly if you remember them. Yes? And maybe I'll put a little caveat. Can I request somebody who has not yet answered so that it becomes slightly more interactive? If, if there's no one else who has answered, I'm going to request you. Anyone else who knows about the five? Harshad Bhai, yes. Yes. Mahatma. Thank you so much. Have you all heard them? I'll again repeat it on the mic. Swami Vivekanand, Sri Aurobindo, Mahatma Gandhi, Gurudev, Rabindranath Tagore, Are Swami, Dayanand Saraswati. I'm sure you would have known that these five people also had a very, very clear connection with the state, with Gujarat. And that's a quiz. If those of you who do not know what was the connection of Gurudev, Rabindranath Tagore with Gujarat, you have to find that out. And you can probably share it with Shubha and Kamalji also who are sitting here. I think you scripted a play, am I right, on Tagore. So this, is the, this forum is meant not just for such lectures here, but then when you all meet over the coffee break, tea break, share, I'm sure there's so many little nooks and corners you can sit and share. That's what these forums are meant to do. So of all these five great luminaries, they contributed to an innovative system of education, not a piecemeal, not something which was about scratching the surface, something which was superficial, but actually thought through, not about tinkering, but actually transforming education. And they just didn't work at the level of ideation. It wasn't an idea in their head. With many of us, talk of ideas and we move away. But they actually moved those ideas on the ground, transposed it and saw it emerge. In Ankur, they sprouted and they saw their experiments. It is a fact that many of these experiments may not have continued with the same spirit, the same zeal, the same ideological passion that the original initiator had because I think that that's the reality of our times that an institution builder may have that but then when he or she moves on the next set of people may not uh, have the same kind of commitment, passion. So in all these five cases we find that a lot of their ideas and especially if you look at someone like Swami Vivekanand and we are celebrating his 150th birth anniversary across the country with a lot of fanfare. He's a youth icon. We realize that his teachings were also crafted in beautiful English. In fact, somebody like Romain Roland has actually gone on to say that Swami Vivekanand's English is like the music of Beethoven, probably, to say that it had that much of beauty in it and absolutely correct absolutely precise and the right words, the right thoughts communicated through the right expression as well. So the idea is India has a tradition of poetry. India has a tradition of oral tradition of having passed down Vedas, Upanishads, we have all of that. We have a tradition also of the very current film world. We have Bollywood, and all the other woods that you will. <laughs> so there, there's so much of music which is a part of us. I still remember there was a song some years back when we were in college which taught people how to count numbers in Hindi. Which song was it? <laughs> right? So I think that song taught everybody to, from Kashmir to Kanyakumari how to count in English whether you were a mu movie buff or whether you hated movies or liked movies. So one of the possible courses of action which this group could collectively deliberate is for young people, uh, Ajay especially, I'm also saying this because we have Harshad Bhai sitting here, we have this whole segment of primary education because until your foundation in childhood is strong, I think to, to really do repair, it's far more difficult than to repair than to prepare. 
Am I right, Javedri? Is it? So, my request to all of you would be, you may also like to consider those of you who are interested, and I'm told there are some poets. Now, I'm not a literary expert. I think uh, people like Mrs. Nityanandam would probably be able to, and of course, Jade Jaji would be able to throw much better light on this. We've had poets from the English firmament, people like Wordsworth, Shelley, and we've also had people like Keats, whose poetry was always thought of Byron as being elevating. It was poetry that inspired people. So if, similarly, if we talk of our own poets, one of them is mentioned in these five people. Who is it? Who got a Nobel? Yes, Tushar. Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore for his Gitanjali. Now, is it possible that we take a few of these poems and also set them to music, which has been done by people like Rishabh Bhai Mehta and Gayatri Ben at the Kakanpur College, people who have been eminent musicians, singers as well. If we can think of some simple poems like this, also simpler, probably, verses which are available, many of these, uh, for instance, I've had access to see some of these in the prayers and various CDs that have come out from the Sri Aurobindo ashram as well, where young boys and girls are taught that you must brush your teeth regularly, you must, uh, you know, some basic etiquettes, manners and so on. So is it possible to also collect, compile all of these so that young children studying in Anganwadi's schools can learn two or three languages because your mental ability, nimbleness to pick up languages is amazing when you're very young. So at a young age, can we teach children at least three languages? Gujarati, English, and possibly one more Indian classical language. It could be Sanskrit, it could be Urdu, it could be Tamil, anything. So this is just a thought for your consideration. And on this note again, I'd like to once again thank each one of you for taking the trouble being present here today. We'd like to thank Cambridge, all our zonal partners and training partners, concepts. I can hurry, see Harish sitting there in the corner silently but doing wonderful work. I'd also like to thank the Times Foundation, Shailendraji. Uh, we must share, we've had an MOU with the Times Foundation and we're very happy the Times Foundation has also agreed to bring out the research uh, uh, is, is that right? The yeah. research report. So all your papers will come out as a part of the Times Foundation. And maybe those of you who'd like to write regularly, this is the gentleman you must get in touch with. Why don't you please stand up so that people can see you, Shailendraji. Let's give him also a big hand. So there's a bit of a win-win strategy there. Well, <laughs> if there are more English people, what happens? Times of India? Our the readership goes up, so it's a bit like scratch, back, st I'll stop it at that, but, but we're open, so there's no exclusivity with one paper, but if there's anybody who wants to fortify our children with English, thank you so much. So any of you wants to contribute regularly for this Times and Scope sort of uh, partnership that we've come together, if we can get some space and bring out, this is an open invitation to all of you. I'd like to finally also thank two special category of people in this group, all of you of course. Uh, we've had many colleges which have become SEZs. What is an SEZ? You all heard of special economic zone, but now we are talking of something else. What is that? Special English zone. So if I understand the concept was that each college were right from the pune to the principal. Everybody got proficient in English. It could be pre-A1 level, A1 level, B1, B2, C1. We felt that that entire college has become fortified with English. So we do have uh, SEZ college principals here. If they are here, can I request you to stand up? You'd be of course given your, given your certificates, but we can give you one round of applause, those of you who are here. Congratulations. And the next time we meet, when we're going to do this, I hope the entire hall gets up. <laughs> right? So we can all lift our hand and pat ourselves in the back next time. I, I hope all of you get inspired by what these friends of ours have been able to do. 
We also like to congratulate our English language entrepreneurs. This is also something which is very new. Yes, entrepreneurs. We felt that young students who have been equipped with this certification, who have C1, C2 certification, who have a fire in their belly and want to do something for propagating English and also earn some legitimate money in the process, we tried to encourage them through something called ELE or English Language Entrepreneurship. So we'll be discussing that in detail. So we will be mentioning and awarding them as well and we'd like to specially congratulate the few L's that we have with us. Are there anybody here? Can we congratulate them? Yes, please stand up. If you're the lone one, then we all get to clap for you. Yeah. <laughs> You'll have to tell us your name. Name? name. Gaurav Patel. Gaurav Patel. Gaurav Bhai, Tame Amara Badha no? Gaurav Cho. Let's clap for him. <laughs> this is an invitation to all you English teachers. I'm sure you found one or two young people with promise. We also need to create a harvest, a new breed of young teachers. Can you not do that? One or two per college. Ate agree vat hai? Can we request each one of you to choose two or three, hand pick, cherry pick, two or three good students who are good at English, good at communication skills and groom them, nurture them to become excellent teachers. Let them start. But I think a good teacher will certainly make a good CEO, he or she will make a good chief minister, a good prime minister, a good president, good vice chancellor, am I right? So we must encourage that. Since I see Patel sir, uh, uh, no I forget your name, Joshi sir, I, I'm going to venture to suggest one more final thing before I thank our partners Casio and Wind Up. You see, I know you have a flair for drama and dramatics, am I right? Not much? <laughs> well, she's being very modest. Very, very modest. We also have Kamal here. This is another request placed before all of you for your consideration. Just as we spoke of poetry in English, simple poems for primary children, secondary, high secondary children and for college students. Can we also think of small scripts in English? And it could be on the life and teachings of some of these luminaries. It could be just about the good values, about cultivating and elevating experience that I just spoke about, that we all feel our society should have. Can we think of scripting short plays? It could be a monologue, it could be something involving two, three people with virtually zero you know, sets and all that. It could just be with some simple, uh, you know, whatever is available, the local materials there. So this is again a small project. Anybody else who would be interested in something like this, writing out short scripts? Excellent. I see several hands going up. And can I request maybe Kamal and Professor Pandya to, would you please stand up, both of you? And of course, uh, Shubha Nigam too. I think she too, Professor Joshi. So maybe those of you who are keen, interested during the course of today, tomorrow, can you set aside some time, not here necessarily in a formal structure, if you can sit in the cafeteria, under the trees, on the tree, <laughs> <laughs> under the blue sky if it's raining, and, and figure out, write some scripts, and then give us a gift of a nice book ready to be printed, and that will be a gift for all the youth of Gujarat. And finally, um, <clears throat> I'll be failing if I don't convey our gratitude to Cassio. We are very thankful that Cassio has come forward in, in, a, in a very big way and we do hope they inspire many other corporates so that this is a paradigm of, you know, each one of us collaborating. It's never about me, 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 me. We cannot do anything alone, but I think it's all about we, all of us collectively. And we are indeed thankful to each one of you for making this event a possibility and a very promising possibility. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you, Madam, for setting the right tone for the two days' deliberation.